Welcome everyone to Ask the Experts, where today we're going to be discussing HBM memory. I'm Tim Messagy, and I am joined by my two memory experts, Frank Farrow, who is the Group Director of Memory and Storage IP at Cadence, and Nadish Kamath, who is the Director of Product Management for Interface IP at Brambus. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks, Tim. Happy to be here. Thanks for the welcome, Tim. Happy to be here. Nice to meet you, Frank. And a big hello to everyone watching this video online. Great. Why don't we kick it off with a question to Nadish. Nadish, in today's computing landscape, where does HBM play? Today's data center applications are evolving from using machine learning to more generalized AI and pose critical performance and efficiency challenges for the underlying computing infrastructure that hosts these applications. As you are well aware, AI and HPC infrastructure use GPUs and AI accelerators extensively. HPM is used in today's computing infrastructure to effectively draw on these advantages and improve performance for AI and HPC. Thank you, Nadish. Frank, given the market focus that Nadish talked about, what are some of the reasons that are driving this rapid evolution in the HBM specification? So as Nadish mentioned, the leading application for HBM is in the data center and specifically uh, AI training. For these training models, the, uh, the growth in data has just been uh, phenomenal. If we look at uh, GPT, for example, that uh, GPT-3 was about 175 billion parameters. As we move into GPT-4, we're talking about 1.7 trillion parameters. So you can see with this, this large amount of data to be processed uh, in these training algorithms, you have to have very high compute power, you need very high memory bandwidth. So this is putting a lot of stress on the existing infrastructure. HPM3 uh, is a really good solution because it offers uh, approaching that terabyte of performance at uh, the standard start at 6.4 gig. As we move into HPM3E now, we see announcements uh, greater than nine gigabits per second. And at nine gigabits per second, you're getting over a terabyte of, of memory bandwidth performance. So this is the kind of uh, bandwidth we need uh, to support these large language models. Nadish, given what Frank talked about, can you then explain some of the characteristics of HBM and HBM 3E specifically that make it um, you know, ideally suitable for AI training? Certainly, thanks for the question, Tim. HPM has three advantages over traditional DDR memory. Firstly, higher memory bandwidth. Second, higher capacity in a compact form factor. And finally, improved power efficiency in terms of picojoules per bit. As Frank alluded to earlier, HBM 3E has a per pin max of 9.6 gigabit per second. Up to 1024 of these high-speed IOs provide the data connectivity to the 12 or more stacks of memory in the 3D package and provide a max bandwidth of up to 1.2 terabyte per second. It's important to note that these memory dies can be addressed in parallel using independent channels to provide a high degree of scalability to train, for example, the 175 billion parameter models that Frank talked about. These are stacked in a vertically integrated form uh, using through silicon vias, also known as TSVs, and provide a memory density of up to 36 gigabyte or so in a small footprint. The TSV technology and the short wire lengths between the GPU and the memory stack makes the HBM solution a more power efficient uh, solution compared to DDR. Thank you, Nadish. Frank, Nadish talked about some of the, the, you know, the performance benefits and advantages, but we're, as we drill down, what are some of the challenges at the physical layer when uh, implementing HBM 3E? So I just want to build a little bit on what Nadish was talking about. So HBM is a wide interface, as, as he mentioned, it's 1,024 
bits of data. So the, the idea with HBM is to go very wide and theoretically go slower by having a, a large number of data bits. Uh, so the advantages, as, as you talked about, was the fact that you do get very high data, you get better power profile, but then the challenges come in because now how do you route those all those signals from the DRAM to the SOC? And this uh, requires uh, some kind of interposer technology. So HBM right now, for the most part, has been using silicon interposers. And then this, this uh, dictates a 2.5D uh, product. So what, uh, what that means is that you have a, uh, your SOC and you have the DRAM, but now you have to put that on some kind of interposer technology that sits on top of a packet substrate that goes on your traditional board. And this, the two and a half D technology is, is not, um, you know, it's, not, it's been, we've been doing HBM now for almost 10 years, but even so the technology is evolving. It's uh, it, a lot of companies are not used to building these two and a half D designs and they do need some uh, help in terms of how to get the maximum performance out of the system. So for example, when you're designing the interposer, you have to look at how do, how do I route these signals in a way that's gonna give me the, the cleanest eyes. So this is where you know, signal integrity uh, and power integrity become a very important part of the design. How do we space the traces? Uh, what are the, um, where do we put ground, uh, the ground layers versus the signals? Uh, what's the thickness of the substrates? Uh, and then there's multiple manufacturers and technology. So yeah, it, it, you're right, Tim, it does become a much more complex uh, challenge for the users who decide to go with HBM. So the advantage, of course, you're getting very the highest bandwidth available at a good power efficiency and a very small footprint. But now you have the 2.5D uh, manufacturing, which you know may be less familiar to, to, uh, to many uh, designers of SOCs. Thank you, Frank. Um, if I could turn it over to Nadish. Nadish, could you talk about the implementation challenges to meet these performance specs on the controller side? Great question, Tim. The main challenge for the memory controller revolves around managing the complexity of the data parallelism at the higher speeds, something that Frank touched upon earlier. Rambus HBM controllers have reordering logic that optimize the outgoing HBM3 transactions and the incoming read data to keep the high bandwidth data interface efficiently utilized for a given performance and power target. The next two challenges have to do with thermal management and in-system testing. With the higher performance requirements, HBM3 memory controllers have to help the system effectively cycle through the memory dies to avoid thermal hotspots. Additionally, the host system is provided readouts of the thermal condition of the memory dies to help in the overall management. Uh, for the testing uh, challenge, the HBM controllers address this by providing test and debug logic to not only test memory at real time data rates, but also for diagnosing any transient problems in the system. Gentlemen, great. How do Cadence and Rambus work together to deliver a complete HBM3 memory subsystem for customers? Frank, let me uh, first direct that to you. Thanks, Tim. Yep, Cadence is the FI expert, so we work closely with customers on the physical layer. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of the key uh, design elements of HBM is the interposer. So uh, we have to understand what the physical environment uh, that the customer is designing in. So we, we, we work with them on the channel, how to maximize the, the signal integrity on interposer, what do those channels look like? Uh, we need to uh, uh, integrate the physical layer, the PHY. Uh, Cadence offers a complete time enclosed uh, hardened PHY that makes it for very easy integration. But that's only you know half the story. So we also have to work very closely with Rambus because customers are also looking at how to optimize their memory in terms of uh, getting the best memory performance. So the PHY and the controller have to work together as they uh, optimize around their 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 memory performance, and then the, the FI and the controller need to interoperate. And our teams have been working closely together 
for a long time uh, doing, do, we've delivered many, uh, many systems together over the last 10 years. Right. I'd, I'd like to add to what Frank mentioned there. Uh, so uh, a great thing about uh, the close collaboration between our design teams. So we are able to design memory controllers that work very well and seamlessly with cadence files. Uh, the Rambus memory controller verification team also works closely with Cadence to ensure that any new uh, releases for Cadence files are fully tested out and supported for our end customers. Given this extensive experience uh, with the files in a variety of foundry processes, mm -hmm. Rambus also provides integration services for their customers to de-risk the IP integration process. Excellent, thanks, Nadish. Frank, where can folks learn more about the, the uh, Cadence HBM3 E5? Sure, you can go to cadence.com and search for IP. Uh, also, I have recently done a presentation uh, for Cadence Live on using HBM3 for a generative AI, and that should be posted soon. I think that's a good uh, encapsulation of a lot of things we've talked about today. Wonderful. Nadish, what about the H the Rambus HBM3 E controller? Where can folks go to learn more about that? Certainly. Uh, customers can learn more about the Rambus HBM3 E solution by visiting the Rambus website and browsing through our extensive collection of product briefs, blogs, and other collateral. Additionally, I'd encourage them to reach out to our field and sales team to look at opportunities for evaluation of the HBM3 EIP. Great, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. And to our audience, thank you for joining us on Ask the Experts as we discussed HBM3 E. And uh, we will see you again back here real soon. Thank, thanks, Tim. Thanks, Nadish. It's been fun. I appreciate it. Thanks, Tim and Frank. It was a pleasure and great to be here. I appreciate uh, you calling me on the show. Thanks, guys. Thanks.